Welcome back to Dr. Finance. I am Andy Kim and today I would like to say thank you very much to every one of you because I, we just passed 500 subscribers landmark in YouTube for Dr. Finance. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then here I have a couple of more things to share and celebrate with you. That's why I'm creating this short video despite I am pressured a lot with my uh, co-authors in my papers, in the research. I have a lot of deadlines coming up soon, but please bear with me. Here's the first thing to celebrate. Number one, European Financial Management gave me this notice today that my paper got topsided over the last two years, 2019 and 20, my article about, my paper about uh, CEO's facial masculinity, right? Uh, facial width to height ratio. That is highly associated with the CEO's risk-taking behavior that shows up in their uh, mergers and acquisition frequency and the money spent on M&A and then the financial leverage, right? They're doing more business with their borrowed money, leveraging up. Okay, naturally, it shows up in their uh, stock return volatility. That paper it turned out to be the top cited paper in this solid leading journal in finance research. Thank you very much, Professor John Dukas. And another thing to celebrate together in this respect is um, recently accepted paper by Melvin Teo in Singapore Management University and Yan Lu at uh, Central Florida, University of Central Florida. Um, congratulations, their papers got accepted at one of the top finance journals, JFQA, Financial and Quantitative Analysis, JFQA. And they look at the facial masculinity of the hedge fund managers this time. Isn't it fun, right? The hedge fund managers, uh, which fund would you choose, right? Um, you wanna look at their face pictures, as long as they are male C, the hedge fund managers, right? And their title is like, do alpha males driver alpha, okay? Deliver alpha. Facial width to height ratio in hedge fund, right? And then and they show that, like it goes like this, more masculine faced uh, hedge fund managers, they are seeking social dominance too much so that they take excessive risk, okay? Turns out they deliver lower alpha. It's not good. They're taking it more risky. Ah, and then it's coherent with my paper about CEOs, right? Uh, excessive risk um, showing up in hedge fund manager world. And then they show hedge funds operated by high facial width to height ratio uh, underperforms the, uh, those operated by low facial width to height ratio managers, bear greater downside risk, and are more susceptible to for fire sales. And then fire sale, isn't, does that sound familiar to you? Archigos? We'll get there. Just a minute. And then... Uh, fail more often. Ooh, okay. High facial width to height ratio managers compensate for their underperformance by marketing their funds more aggressively. I told you before that they are good salesmen, right? If you have something to sell right now to survive for the survival of your company, masculine faced guys, they are the best salesperson. They're gonna sell it, okay, for you. That's why we need them in our leadership position somewhere at the top. But that is a, uh, what is it? A double-edged sword, right? So the, the negative side of it is like they take excessive risk. So we have to be careful in managing this kind of company, uh, guys, right? It's about managing the different people by looking at their face traits, okay? Uh, very interesting finding over here. Uh, they're, they're by uh, garnering higher flows of uh, and fee revenues by exploiting major uh, personal events that shape testosterone, namely marriage and fatherhood. We trace, they trace the biological me mechanism underlying their relationship between FWHR and investment performance to circulating testosterone. Their findings are robust and extend to equity mutual funds. So 
um, they, you know, here are, well, you know, Andy Kim is over there as one of the, you know, they recognize it. Thank you. Uh, in their acknowledgement. And then their paper goes on, right? Uh, you can download their papers in the website by, you know, Googling this title of the paper. Go ahead and read it. Very fun. I highly recommend, strongly recommend, right? Finally got into top finance journals. Like, you know, finance academia has been so much conservative, right? I had a hard time getting in there, but they successfully got in there. So I'm very happy about that. Um, and uh, now one more thing, a couple of more things to advertise to you. And here I'd like to share my website where you can upload your face picture and then measure your own facial masculinity. Ah, yes, we can do that. How? Well, type in www. Let me see. www. F W H R measuring. Com. Ah, that's my website created by my RAs. And then here, you just all you have to do is just upload your face picture. Okay, browse button, and then here is my pic uh, picture. Right, that's me. Double click it. And then upload. Then it gives you voila. Ah, the measuring result like this with 68 different landmarks identified automatically with face recognition technology. And then um, the FWHR number got spit out over here. Uh, and then it tells me, right, where I belong among thousands of people who just uploaded their face picture and then measured the number right like that out of those number distribution where do i stand right i can see that out of it um it's like 15 19 and what's the percentile 80th percentile from the top to bottom right so top one percentile that's highly masculine guy and then 100 percentile that's feminine face guys so my face over here is like 80th percentile, which means more feminine kind of face. You see why I am a professor instead of being a banker or a salesman, right? Um, that shows up. And then um, you can click this box and then it shows the width to height ratio box naturally. And then if you scroll down, you can see some more descriptions where this Korean CEO's FWHR ratio, if we upload it, 1.84. Remember that number? 1.84 for Korea's, uh, you know, big companies, uh, CEOs, right? High risk takers. I'm not a CEO kind of guy. I can see that in my face. And then, of course, the facial expression has to be neutral, okay? Like that. Caucasian theirs is a bit bigger. Okay, the, the bone structure is a bit different, right? It's wider, I say. It's not bigger um, because this vertical sense, Korean, uh, including myself, is a lot longer over here. But what matters over here is the width, not the height. Okay, um, you see, Caucasian guys, they are, you know, or American overall, it's bigger number in FWHR. And you can see my RAs and myself, you know, our citations, you can see it. Um, so that's one thing I would like to advertise to you. Number uh, three is Archigos. I told you about this one. And then um, hedge fund managers, right? Since March 30th, Goldman Sachs, right? Was reported to have some huge amount of block trade, block deals to selling off right those china related stocks why did they have to sell it in a block deal cheaply in a fire sale well because they you know had a hedge fund or family office client who had some severe margin call issues because their family for of office by bill huang all right turns out to be a huge one like a 50 billion dollars worth or something um their position was highly leveraged. Actually, their own money was a lot smaller, but their leverage was like five times, okay? Uh, to put it in a perspective, right? The uh, Professor Yi Nam Woo in Yonsei University said in his YouTube um, that his 
Yinamu's uh, used to be uh, Merrill Lynch's stock analyst, right? More conservative guy. His hedge fund, his leverage position was like 150 times or 150 uh, percent or something, 1.5 times, right? But here it's like five times versus 1.5 or like this, right? Huge leverage. Ah, the leverage, risk taking, and then that was concentrated, not diversified, right? But concentrated on those you know, China related stocks and then some communication stocks like that, right? Broadcasting related stocks, right? Um, high risk taker, right? Um, who is it? Bill Huang. Turns out to be Korean one, right? Do, you, do I know Bill Huang? No, not, you know. I'm too young, right? He's 10 years older than me, I guess. Um, but turns out he is one of the most well-known guys, perhaps the well most well-known guys among Korean Americans in Wall Street, right? Um, he used to work in Tiger Fund by Julian Robertson, and which went gone down during the dot-com bubble because he was taking the opposite direction, the position too much, right? Again, when other people are going to one direction, you have to have that courage to, you know, go to the other direction. In the end, they got screwed. Um, but uh, he was in that Julian Robertson's Tiger Fund, and especially he was in Hong Kong, right? And Tiger Asia, later on, he built up another fund, right? Even though the Tiger original one gone bad, right? Nowhere, right? Um, and then, belly up, I say. Uh, the thing is, in 2012, right, his Tiger Asia turned out to be you know, sued by the Chinese government, and then they had to pay, you know, a uh, penalty, right? You know, uh, a huge amount of penalty because of insider trading uh, litigation, right? Which means, you know, if you are the hedge fund managers, you know, or, or, or if you want to deal with anybody, right? You, you know, this is the first one you should avoid, okay? Uh, you should avoid, uh, like, so you have to be careful, but Goldman Sachs or investment banks, um, after 2015 or something, right, um, they forgot about it. Maybe their compliance officers did not care about it too much. So that the Bill Huang, when he created a fund or a family office by himself, right, um, Goldman and Morgan Stanley, they served as a, what, the um, prime broker for this, right? And then the thing is, his company was leveraging up so much and then con taking concentrated position. <laughs> Why don't you diversify, right? But that has something to do with his risk, prof uh, risk preference. And that show seems to show up in his face. That's what I'm saying, okay? And can I measure his facial masculinity? And why not? Let's, yeah, I'm going to finish within a minute or something so just a minute here i upload his face picture double click it and upload it and there you are voila yes and you see this number 1.92 right is well above well above my facial masculinity of course and then well above um average Korean CEOs, big company CEOs already. So you can see that, that he's a wild risk taker, right? And then Melvin Teo's, yeah, if you borrow his, their finding, uh, Yan Lu, right? The more masculine fund managers, well, their alpha is not good. More likely to end up in fire sales like this. Ah! Their research in Melvin Teo is more concentrated on Caucasian fund managers, but I say, regardless of the race, even Asian fund managers, we see that, okay? It's a very interesting anecdote, okay? So supporting our findings, yes. So um, one thing, you know, this face is informative. And then you have to know where to put this kind of person. He must be a great salesperson. But I'd say as a fund manager, we want to be careful. Okay. Now, some of you may wonder if this kind of facial masculinity and risk preference is also found among Wall Street bankers, uh, Caucasian population. 
um, because Bill Huang is Asian one, right? I let me show you Tom Montag. Who is that? Tom Montag. Is it familiar name? Um, yeah, actually, uh, if you remember uh, global financial crisis in 2008, right? Um, you remember this, right? Um, the he Senate hearing by what is it? Carl Levin of Michigan. You remember him? And remember, he went through the emails of Goldman Sachs, right? And then in 2007 or something, the Goldman Sachs made a credit derivative CDO or synthetic CDO whose mathematical structure is so complicated that you, you may hope and pray that mathematicians can value this one precisely because you love math. I love math too, but I can't and they cannot either right uh, the thing is they don't know the value and then they just sold it like a russian roulette kind of bomb bomb sharing right and you circulate the bomb hope and pray that you are not the one who will you know get it and then just sell it off expensively get the money and then run away that was the deal 600 million dollars worth of it and the deal was called the uh, timber wolf once they packaged the deal and then sold it to their clients and then the internally they circulated this email Whew. That timber wolf was, boy, that was one shitty deal, right? They circulated and then they were like, <laughs> yeah, we sold it. And then just kachang, kachang and run away, right? Who did it? And then he found out that email and then what got troubled in his mind, right? And then questioned, interrogated like this Goldman Sachs bankers. And they say like, what is, where is your ethics, right? You're bad bankers. And then they blamed him, right? and criticized them. And then the Goldman Sachs bankers like him came up and said, um, sorry, sir, I did not do that. Eh? What? You did not do that? What do you mean? My predecessor did it. Ah. And the, turns out the Timberwolves deal, right? The writer of that email left, had left Goldman Sachs even before that, the, 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 the financial trouble, right? The thing is, that was this guy was promoted, actually scouted by Merrill Lynch. Eight months later, he shows up in Merrill Lynch as a salesperson, right? He was a you know, strong salesperson in Goldman Sachs. You have to be a strong salesperson to be able to sell that kind of things and say, make money and they say, that was a shitty deal, right? And he was scouted because of that kind of things. And then the thing is, as the crisis unfolded, the thing is, his scouter, John Tain of Merrill Lynch, got fired because of the uh, you know, CDO, that very product, those kind of products, right? And the thing is, this guy did not get fired. The thing is, Merrill Lynch got ta taken over by Bank of America, and then he survived. Now, he is number two COO of Bank of America, yes! And he's there making a lot of money and his uh, compensation is sometimes bigger than the CEO, right? Even though he's number two position, the pay is number one. Uh, he's the boss, right? Uh, who is making the most money, right? Um, that's this person over here. And we can see that uh, my hobby over here, I just uploaded his picture in my website and then it throws out this number 1.946 remember bill huang was 1.94 right and it's among like 30th percentile or something very high number by the way right um even in my distribution and then of the, those managers right so it's way above either caucasian or asian ceos high risk takers and then the you know um melvin teo's research they find that this kind of fund if he were fund managers this kind of guy are more likely to end up with fire sales later on or downside risk that's it that's it asian or caucasian it does not matter it shows up the face is informative and then that's something unexpected from the mathematician's point of view. How is it explained by mathematics? I don't think everything has to be explained by mathematics. It has to be, you know, math gives us a nice 
framework of analyzing and uh, enables us to predict the directions. But that's not all, some part of it. We have to incorporate the findings by biology or medical research, right? And psychology. And that's behavioral finance. We are not claiming mathematics is like worthless or anything, but we need to incorporate those two things, combine somehow, okay? How that's something we could incorporate in the future later. Okay, that's where we stand. I hope you liked it. And then like and subscribe. Thank you.